The first impressions of this site really are nothing surprising. There's a bit of an innocuous tower. You've got a small house nearby. But other than that, nothing really untoward. Even though it is well cared for, you can just tell that no one has ever called this place home. This small building, in fact, harbors a vast secret. Once you go through this unobtrusive front entrance, now you realize that you are in a very large kind of operation. You go into this long underground tunnel that leads into a big underground labyrinth. You can tell that somebody wanted to come underground and hide something very valuable from something very terrible. This is clearly a place someone has built out of fear. So what horrors drove people to build inside this hill? And did disaster ever strike? The roots of this structure can be found buried deep in the fear-ridden early years of the Cold War when the world had just entered the nuclear age. 1949, Joseph Stalin, who is one of the most ruthless, brutal dictators of history, explodes an atomic bomb. This takes the West by surprise, and this changes the entire game. President Truman has announced, we must now alert the whole world to the peril that this event brings into being. With a growing fear spreading throughout the world, facilities like this sprung up across Britain. But they weren't just for hiding away in. During the Second World War, Britain had a network of radar stations to warn of Nazi attack. But once Soviet nuclear attack became a threat, there was a hasty effort to build new ones. Early warning becomes a top priority during the Cold War. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Those few minutes of early warning might make the difference between an effective counterstrike, effective survival of your forces or some of your forces, and your national destruction. Built under a cloak of secrecy, the new radar system named Rotor had a network of operation centers across the country, including this one, the Kelvin Hatch secret nuclear bunker. During the nuclear weapons testing in the late 1940s, early 1950s, they realized that everything above ground, even a small nuclear weapon, would just devastate everything. It's all gone. However, people could survive if they're underground. The location itself was somewhat strategic because there was an RAF base nearby, but also the nature of the rock was important because instead of being on soft material like the London clay, this was actually under much harder bedrock. Covered in 15 feet of topsoil, the outer layer of the bunker is a Faraday cage to protect it from an electromagnetic pulse. Inside that is a brick skin, a 10-foot thick concrete wall, and three fully operational floors. A 120-yard tunnel leads out to the entrance, masquerading as a small countryside bungalow. This was a colossal construction, 27,000 square feet of area, completely hidden. There's about 40,000 tons of concrete that were used to construct the whole thing, a real engineering marvel. Everyone knew in the 50s that there were Russian spies everywhere. And that meant that it was impossible to keep it a secret that there were command bunkers all over the country. But nobody knew exactly where those bunkers were located. 
now owned by Mike Parrish, the farmer whose land this sits on. He's become the expert on the site and knows its imminent attack protocol. We've now got the blast doors here, which once they're shut, well, everybody will be in here for at least three months. The bunker could support up to 600 inhabitants. And once locked inside, it was these machines that kept the radiation out. The air would normally flow into this fan here, which would just pump it straight into the bunker. But if it had become contaminated, then they'd switch that one off and switch the one over there on, which would, in theory, filter all the nasty things out before it actually got inside the bunker itself. So actually, this is what's keeping us all alive. But while the completed bunker functioned as planned, the wider rotor network soon had a problem. Built in less than a year, very, very quick. But interestingly as well, in such a short time, the way that the radars were changing became fairly redundant quite quickly. Within only a few years, there was no longer a need for these rotor control centers. But with its proximity to London and the central government, this site would soon have a potentially far more important role to play. All major powers during the Cold War developed large underground bunkers, facilities that were survivable in case of nuclear attack, and that was to preserve and protect the government. If everything goes wrong, here is a way at least that they can maintain some kind of control even in a devastated country afterwards. Around the mid-1980s, Britain had a new network of regional government headquarters, many of which utilized the former rotor bunkers. The British government was going to briefly disintegrate when a nuclear attack happened, and all of the cabinet members would be assigned a different region of the country where they would go and as a minister of the crown would be the most senior person for miles around. In this worst case scenario, this facility is near London. It would have protected several hundred of the key personnel and enabled them to live for weeks with telecommunications linking this site to other regional headquarters and a BBC broadcasting suite to speak to those on the outside, the officer in charge would play a vital role in coordinating the nation's recovery. But first, the population had to be reassured there was a real chance of survival. It was important to government not to let people know just how bad the effects of nuclear war, thermonuclear war, would be. They were afraid that if people really knew what would happen, they would lose hope. Governments around the world issued advice on what to do in the event of catastrophe, offering some faint hope to cling to. But had the bombs ever been dropped, it would have been in rooms like this that the real fight for survival would have played out. They would be able to plot it on these cold perspex here. The red ones were ground bursts. They produced a, a lot of radiation because they picked the dirt up, and that's what the threat was, because radiation is carried on dust. There'd be people the other side there who would be able to write backwards, describing where the radiation is flowing. So all the time that information was fed upstairs so that they'd be able to deploy buses and coaches to move the population out of the way of the radiation, if that was indeed possible. If called into action, the fate of the population would have been in the hands of those working in here. I suspect they would have been very professional and they'd got on with the job. But I know if I was down here and I knew my family was at great risk and the whole world was about to fall apart, I, my mind wouldn't be 100% on crayoning in which way the wind was blowing. Primed and ready for action for decades, ultimately, the site was never called upon. And when the threat level dropped, the bunker was decommissioned.